and welcome to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today, we're very excited. We have a special guest, Jay Olbernolte, uh, Assemblyman from the 33rd District, joining us today. Jay, how are you doing? And welcome to the program. I'm great. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of your Assembly District and the area you come from and kind of what the COVID situation there has been? Sure. I represent the 33rd Assembly District. That's the northern half of San Bernardino County. It's very rural. I have the second largest Assembly District in the state, so I represent almost 10,000 square miles of rural California, seven different cities. I have a lot of mountains and a lot of desert in my district. Uh, like many other parts of the state, my district has been hit very hard by the COVID crisis. Uh, we have not had a lot of cases, but uh, we're still struggling to reopen. And uh, the, uh, the county is still uh, trying to figure out how to comply with the state's requirements on going to stage 2B uh, of the reopening plan. We're having trouble with testing. The, the county, the, uh, my district is just so spread out, it's really difficult to get testing resources to the places that they're needed. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, learning about the counties in San Bernardino County being, you know, one of the largest counties in the nation, bigger than some states. Uh, That's right. Has that proved difficult as, you know, maybe certain regions of the county might be uh, further ahead than others? And has there been talk about kind of inter-county variances? Well, we certainly, uh, the County of San Bernardino submitted a request to the state before Gavin Newsom's uh, revised order a uh, week Go I'm requesting for some flexibility given the rural nature of the county and kind of the unique, uh, the unique needs and situation there. Um, at this point, the county is, is thinking that perhaps we can comply with the state's requirements, uh, but they're still working through it. I believe that there's a meeting of the County Board of Supervisors in just a couple hours today to discuss that topic, and hopefully within the next week we'll get that sorted out. Um, kind of, you know, how, how was the sheltering in place experience for you? Um, you know, before, you know, you got back to the assembly, kind of, can you explain um, kind of your experience and, and how it was legislating while sheltering in place? Sure. Well, like many of my colleagues, I found myself more busy staying at home than uh, I, I normally would be traveling around the district. You know, traveling around the district is unusual for us to have uh, four or five events a day, but uh, sheltering in place from at home, I found myself with a dozen events a day uh, just because, so many of my constituents were interested in communicating with their elected representation. Uh, so many people had concerns that they need to address. And then uh, the workload for our district office staff has been enormous because so many people are hurting. They need to be connected to unemployment resources through the EDD or the SBA loan programs liaising with our federal representation. So uh, all of that has been uh, tremendously uh, impactful. Um, you know, for those who don't know, you're also the vice chair on the Assembly Budget Committee. Yes. Um, kind of, you know, a lot of has been talked about recently about a lot of these uh, oversight hearings you guys had on the mass deals and such, uh, such as that. Um, can you kind of elaborate kind of on some of the things that you found or discovered kind of going over some of these um, COVID contracts that you guys have been analyzing? Sure. Well, uh, so before the legislature went into recess, we passed a bill called SB 89 that gave the governor a billion dollars of appropriation authority to deal with stopping the spread of coronavirus. And uh, under that bill, what the governor was uh, was required to do is submit notice to the Joint Legislative Budget Committee under Section 36 of the bill, which is called Section 36 Notice, uh, of his intent to spend those funds. Um, so that's placing extraordinary trust in the governor. I think in a lot of cases, the governor uh, respected that trust, uh, and uh, there were very few of those Section 36 letters uh, that I personally objected to, but there were a couple. And the ones that I objected to were the ones where I felt he was exceeding the authority that we had given him. We gave him authority to deal with the spread of coronavirus. However, uh, everyone acknowledged that there were going to be huge challenges that the state would face in recovering economically from the crisis and socially from the crisis. And in SB 89, we made it very clear to the executive branch that the legislature wanted to be an equal partner in figuring out what those solutions were. And I think that the governor, in some ways, went way beyond the authority that we gave him. Uh, I think it was it was well-intentioned, but we're a set, we are a uh, co-equal branch of government. We have have a constitutional role to play in oversight of that spending authority, and we wanted to be included in, the, uh, in those decisions, and in some instances, we were not. And that frustration uh, is not just mine, I mean, it was a, a bicameral, bipartisan frustration with the governor for not including the legislature more in those spending decisions. 
um, as part of the budget committee, you know, you were one of the first members to come back up to Sacramento. Kind of, can you describe kind of how how it has been kind of legislating during this time? Well, it's a little surreal. Uh, we have been unable to reach agreement with the Senate on a plan for being able to legislate remotely. So uh, we have some constitutional concerns about our ability to make remote votes. And uh, the Senate is trying very hard to protect all of the members of the legislature from uh, contracting coronavirus since you know, quite a few of the members are in high risk uh, medical categories. So uh, it's been a challenge. So when we have hearings, you'll see us in socially distanced rooms. So we're using only the largest of our uh, of our committee rooms, uh, normally it's every third seat that's occupied, so we're, we're all spread out throughout the room. Uh, we, uh, we wear masks, except uh, perhaps when we need to present, uh, and uh, we're, we're careful to, to disinfect all the surfaces, all the microphones have, have covers on them, so we're trying to be uh, very cautious and strike a balance between the need to protect the health of uh, not only the legislature, legislators, but our staff, uh, but also uh, to respect our need to conduct the public's business because uh, obviously time is growing very short from, uh, for us budgetarily. The Constitution requires us to pass a budget by June 15th and that date is fast approaching. So, uh, you know, this is far from normal legislative calendar in terms of crafting the budget. Right. Normally, you guys would be having budget hearings. Uh, the right. speaker just announced, you know, there's going to be this committee of a whole, uh, something new, something a lot of us haven't heard. Can, it, can you kind of update us on kind of how this committee as a whole is going to work and kind of physically, uh, you know, are you guys going to be on the floor? You know, kind of where have you heard this is going to take place? Well, so this will be held on Tuesday. It's a very unusual occurrence. It uh, hasn't been done in uh, quite some time. However, what it do does is allows us as a body to conduct a hearing that uh, is like a committee hearing, allows us to uh, pose questions of witnesses, which normally, as you're aware, is not done uh, in four sessions, but also allows all of the members of the assembly to be there at once. And the reason why we're thinking that that's required is the short, very short uh, uh, calendar limits on our ability to deliver a bu budget by the middle of June. So we want to make sure that we give our uh, members an opportunity to ask the questions that they need to ask. So that's going to be on Tuesday at one o'clock. The procedure is going to be that we have to convene uh, the assembly in a regular floor session and then there'll be a procedural motion that requires a two-thirds uh, affirmative vote for us to go into a committee of the whole. And then that committee hearing will progress at, at very similar to a committee hearing uh, with questions from and statements from our members. So uh, because this is related to the budget, uh, Chairman Ting will preside over the assembly. Because I'm the vice chairman, I will be, uh, I will be vice chairman of the gathering. And uh, we'll each give an opening statement. And then uh, we'll have presentations from the Department of Finance and the legislative analysts. Uh, and then open it up to questions and statements from our members. And so we, we think that probably going to take about oh two or three hours that uh, will be in session and that'll be on tuesday um yeah the newsom kind of released his may revise last week um a different budget than he presented in january uh predicting 54 billion dollars shortfall um lots of cuts um contingent kind of on uh federal stimulus coming in um you know how, how have, have you looked at this budget and kind of what are you and your caucus planning on presenting uh to the assembly well, certainly uh, I've been deeply involved in analyzing what the governor, the governor is proposing. Uh, I think it's important to note that this is a proposal by the governor. Uh, this is not the governor that writes the budget. The legislature writes the budget and the governor either approves by signing the budget bill or uh, disapproves by vetoing the budget bill. But, you know, that's, that's the way that the process is supposed to work. Certainly we all have, face a monumental challenge in balancing the budget this year. Unlike the federal government, we do not have the option of deficit spending. We can't run a structural deficit. Our constitution requires us to pass a balanced budget every year, which means that we have to deal with this revenue shortfall. So our the projected revenue shortfall, shortfall is about a third of overall state revenues. Uh, in response to that, the governor is proposing about a 9% reduction in state expenditures, and he's plugging the rest of the holes uh, with some tactics that I agree with, normal, uh, namely using uh, uh, some of our budget reserve funds. We're, we're using almost $8 billion from the 
uh, the BSA, what we call our rainy day fund. We're using another billion dollars from our safety net reserve accounts and public school stabilization accounts. So uh, that's appropriate. I also think it's appropriate that we're only using uh, less than half of those reserves. That's an acknowledgement of the fact that this is going to be a multi-year budget problem. In other words, we're not just going to have to face this this year. I think that the legislature is going to be in the same situation next year uh, as we're struggling to, to get uh, our stimulus going and our economy moving again. Um, However, the governor is doing some things that I very much disagree with to balance this budget. I think it's very important that we're the adults in the room. We have to face this situation head on. And although the cuts are painful, I think that they need to be made uh, in a way that doesn't cut, kick the can down the road. And in a couple of instances, the governor is using what I call gimmicks, budgetary gimmicks, to balance the budget. And I'll give you a couple of examples. First of all, he's proposing over $10 billion in inner fund borrowing. And what that is, is we have a lot of funds within the Department of Finance that are we, what we call encumbered. So they can only be used for specific purposes. They cannot be used for general purposes. So what the governor is proposing to do is to borrow money from those funds, transfer them into the general fund, and then sign a document that says that later, the state will pay those funds back from the general fund with interest. And uh, I think that that's not honoring the uh, the spirit of the law that requires us to balance the budget. I mean, that's, that is essentially fa uh, financing our existing budget deficit with borrowing. And those funds are just going to have to be repaid in the future. They're going to have to be repaid with interest. And I just don't think it's an honest way of going about it. And uh, another thing the governor is talking about doing is uh, some deferrals. Uh, he's got... Uh, looks like uh, a little over $5 billion in, uh, in spending deferrals. And uh, if your listeners aren't familiar, what a deferral is, is imagine your rent is due on the 31st of December, uh, but you're over budget on rent this year. So instead of paying it on the 31st, you, you, you wait a day and you pay it on the 1st of January the following year so that you can say that you met your budget for the current year. You know, that's not an honest way of going about it because you're still paying this year's obligation even though you did it a little bit late. Uh, and it's going to count against your budget next year if you do it that way. You know, next year, you'll almost certainly be over budget on rent if that was your philosophy. So the governor's proposing to do that with over $5 billion in K-12 spending and uh, over half a billion dollars in spending for the community colleges. And uh, I, I, I just, I, that's a gimmick. I don't think that we ought to be balancing the budget that way. Um, you know, every every year people talk about California and its taxes. Are you aware of any new kind of revenue or, or tax proposals that are being floated by uh, uh, members of the Assembly or Senate that, um, you know, you think will be coming forth soon? Well, I haven't heard a lot of legislative uh, tax increases. Uh, however, we're certainly aware, as your listeners are, I'm sure, of the uh, tax increases that have been proposed by the governor, because there are a couple that, that increased uh, tax on vaping. Uh, there are some taxes, changes to business taxes that will result in tax increases. The uh, disallowance of net operating losses for medium and large businesses is one of them. Um, uh, the, the disallowance of use of more than $5 million of tax credits is another. I don't think that that's fair. I mean, I think that if we pass a tax credit and we say, okay, look, if you do this, we'll give you a credit, and people have planned for that, that it's unfair to say, oh, by the way, you know what, we were just kidding. Uh, you can only use a certain percentage of those this year because we have a budget problem. Um, you know, in addition, though, I think we all have to be cognizant of the changes to uh, Prop 13 that are being proposed on the ballot in November. Uh, this is the so-called so split roll tax provision that would uh, that would limit the effect of Prop 13 to just residential properties and not commercial properties. In other words, so commercial properties would no longer enjoy the tax protections of Prop 13. And uh, I, it's something I'm very much opposed to. Uh, I'm a believer in Prop 13. I think that in 1978, the voters of California drew a line in the sand and said, this is the maximum amount of tax that's reasonable to assess against property and no more. And uh, I think that if we allow it to be weakened, it's going to be just uh, uh, taking a brick out of the wall and the whole wall, wall is going to collapse. And I think we're going to lose those protections as we move forward. So it's something that uh, I've been telling people to be very aware of that we need to make sure that people will know on that in November. Um, as, as Vice Chairman of the Budget Committee, um, kind of how has your outlook on the budget change and your priorities on the budget change um, with this crisis and kind of what are you looking, you know, for, for you and for your constituents to get um, out of this budget this year? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think anyone that's looking to get something out of the budget is going to be disappointed. Uh, the, the best that people can hope for is not to have cuts made. And uh, I'll tell you, a lot of my time over the last couple of weeks has been fielding calls from people all over the state, organizations nonprofits, social programs saying, please, 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 legislature, do not cut our budget. And uh, it's heartbreaking because these people represent real needs uh, in our uh, in our communities. And, and yet we've got this huge $54 billion budget shortfall that uh, we have to deal with. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be painful. Uh, I think that the guiding principles that we need to uh, to observe is, you know, first of all, we need to make sure that, that we uh, don't make budget cuts that are going to prevent the state from uh, recovering economically. And uh, some examples of that would be, you know, we certainly don't want to cut health care. Uh, that's something that, that people are going to need. We're in the middle of an epidemic, so uh, that's important. Uh, also, I think we need to be cognizant that, uh, that we need, we're going to need to help our businesses recover because businesses where jobs come from and a lot of people are out of work and a lot of our businesses are hurting especially our small businesses so we need to make sure that we pay attention to things like unemployment insurance uh, we've taken massive multi-billion dollar what are called title 12 loans to shore up from the federal government to shore up unemployment system we need to make sure we budget for the state paying that back in the future the last time the state took those loans the state failed to pay them back and the federal government assessed penalties for years against every a business in the state. In fact, it was until 2018 that we finally ended up paying that back. And then the other thing is we need to recognize that, you know, the businesses have furloughed employees because state government required them to. It's not their fault. Uh, in December, the Employment Development Department is going to recalculate the unemployment insurance rates for every employer in California for the next uh, budget year. And we need to make sure that we hold those employers harmless. We can't uh, let those rates go way up you know, just when those businesses are trying to recover for something that wasn't their fault. Right. Kind of, you know, uh, we've heard that many legis uh, members of the legislature have had to pare their bill package down. Um, kind of, you know, what, what, how many bills are you carrying this year and how has that changed as this crisis unfolds? Well, certainly we're, we're all trying, given, you know, out of respect for the shortened legislative calendar, we're trying to pare our bill packages back. Uh, I normally would be carrying 25 bills going into the cycle. We pared our package down to seven. Wow. Um, so uh, I think most legislators are in that same boat. And kind of, uh, your seven bill package, kind of what is the focus of those seven bills? Oh, uh, you know, most of my bills are usually increasing uh, the, the, the efficiency of government, uh, especially using technology to empower those increases. So uh, I've got those bills. We paired them back to just the bills that, can, that are uh, uncontroversial because I don't want to take up committee time with them. So, uh, so most of my bills are bills that were designed to go through on what we call consent, which means that they don't, uh, they don't actually have to be heard. It's just that it gets tagged with the yes vote for everybody because of the uncontroversial nature. I've got a couple that, uh, that I'm passionate about. I would really uh, like to continue increasing the number of judgeships in California. Uh, we're, we're short by hundreds of judges statewide, and the highest judicial need uh, are in the sections of the state that I represent. So that's something that, uh, that I'd like to see done. So I, I'm trying to add 25 judges. Uh, that's an uphill battle this year because of the budget crisis. So. Uh, but that's one that I still think is important to, to have a discussion about. Uh, and also there's uh, the bills that, that uh, we have, as we say, they have urgency, which means that they have to be done this year. I've got one of those, uh, the junior hunting license program is expiring at the end of the year. In fact, at the end of the summer, if we don't uh, renew it, it will expire. And so that's something we have to take action on now. And so that's one of the bills that I have. Uh, there's a lot of hope, kind of the federal government kind of coming with a bailout or some sort of funds to the state to help alleviate these, uh, you know, budget shortfalls. Um, have you been talking to people in Washington and seeing the likelihood of California getting any relief from D.C.? Yes, uh, I have. I've talked to my colleagues at uh, the federal government and in Congress quite often. Um, you know, obviously, Governor Newsom has structured his budget proposal with federal triggers so that uh, he's outlined cuts that will be made unless the federal government steps in and, uh, with uh, $14 billion, at least, of money for California. And, uh, you know, I think it's unwise, actually, to count on help from the federal government, uh, just because the federal government has a responsibility to taxpayers the same way that we do. And, uh, you know, they're looking at a federal deficit uh, 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 and a federal debt that is approaching the largest in the history of our country. 
uh, even if you account for the size of our gross domestic product. So the largest that the debt has ever been has been at the, the end of World War II. And with uh, CARES and CARES II, the, the, the current round of stimulus that's passed Congress, uh, if you count those in, we're almost up to that same level of debt. And the HEROES Act that passed the House of Representatives last week, if that were to pass the Senate and be signed by the President, we would actually be above that level of debt. And so you have to take that very seriously. And so uh, it's a difficult decision for them, but something that they're, they're going to be grappling with. Uh, I wouldn't count on, on that. Certainly, we're not going to be able to count on that for uh, the budget this year. It has to be passed by June 15th, which means it has to be, has to be crafted, you know, substantially before then. And I just don't think that Congress is going to act on, on another round of stimulus before then. Um, if there were to be stimulus coming, I guess, after you guys pass the budget, what would be the mechanism for you guys to, I guess, reapproach those cuts or, or the budget um, after receiving federal aid? Well, the governor has, has written them in automatically. So he has said, uh, if the federal government uh, acts, then this will be the budget. And if the federal government doesn't act, then here is another tranche of cuts that will automatically occur. And they're big cuts, a 10% base reduction to funding for the University of California. 10% base reduction to the California State University, automatic 10% pay reduction for all state employees. I mean, big, big things. Right. Um, and some, some things, by the way, that shouldn't be on there. You know, while we're on the subject, uh, one of the things that we're proposing to do is to close some veterans' homes, which is the last thing that I would do you know, for, for cuts. And there, there are many things we could cut before we make a veterans homeless. So, uh, you know, that's the, the Veterans Home in Barstow, which is in my district, is one of the things that is in that uh, proposed federal trigger that would be closed unless the federal government acts. And I think that's incredibly inappropriate. I and mean, that's, that's going back on our promise and our commitment to our veterans. Uh, and this is a very vulnerable population. It's, it's the last place that we should be trying to save money. Um, just prior to the shelter in place orders, um, you won a primary for your congressional district. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, how is campaigning going uh, for November and kind of how, how do you see kind of campaigning going for you kind of with this uh, new era of kind of staying away from people? Well, honestly, we've suspended the campaign for, for the time being. You know, it's, uh, we have bigger issues to face as a state. Uh, I have a large responsibility uh, not only to my constituents in the 33rd Assembly District, but uh, as Vice Chair of the Budget Committee with, you know, the largest budget deficit in, in state history, uh, and that's taking up all of my time. So uh, it, we'll, we'll pick up the campaign again when we get on the other side of the budget, and as some of the stay-at-home orders are relaxed, we can start having events again, start fundraising again. Um, but you know what? That's, it really doesn't bother me. That's, that's in keeping with my general philosophy on campaigning. Uh, we in, in the assembly have to run for re-election every two years the same way that we have to in Congress. And we have a primary, a mandatory primary every two years. So that's a, an election a year on average. And if you focus on campaigning instead of doing your job, it'll drive you crazy. You know, so I've, I've always figured that uh, we're elected to do the best job we can. That includes getting out in front of our constituents, listening to them, uh, getting to know what their problems are, and then coming to Sacramento and trying to solve their problems. If we're doing those things that we're already campaigning. And if we're not doing those things that we frankly don't deserve to get reelected. So those are the things that I'm focusing on. And I'm sure we'll, we'll pick the congressional campaign back up here in another a couple of months as, uh, as the state is, uh, get, gets further down the road to recovery. Um, earlier you touched upon kind of how you came from a tech, tech background and you're trying to implement more tech solutions into state government. Um, you know, how has this crisis kind of shaped uh, or helped, you know, the, the, the use of technology in kind of state government or, or what you do? And how do you think technology could be used in the future um, to kind of help legislate? Well, I mean, it's fundamentally altered a lot of business in California. And frankly, I think some of those alterations are permanent, you know, for better or for worse. I think people are realizing that working from home is a viable option for a lot of different industries. I think people's eyes have been opened to the value of virtual meetings, uh, to the value of not having to drive places and, uh, the, you know, the, all the concomitant time that that wastes. Um, uh, however, I think it also has a downside. I think some of the jobs that have been lost to automation are not going to come back. So uh, if you look at some of the projections, uh, we think that our economic recovery could be relatively quick, but we think that uh, our employment recovery is, is going to take years. It's going to take at least two years to get back up to the level of employment that we had before the coronavirus hit. So, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but, uh, you know, hopefully in, in hindsight, you know, we get, 
10 years down the road, we'll look back and say it was uh, that that part of the impact was positive for uh, the application of technology to making our industries more efficient. Do you ever see a, a situation where you think remote voting would be happening uh, in the assembly? Well, thanks for joining us, Jay. Sorry, sorry you dropped off, but uh, thanks for joining us. And we look forward to talking to you again. Our